several interceders in the audience tonight as well. Good that you made that effort to be here. Um, let us begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and we pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Winter has truly set in. Uh, we're past the halfway mark of this year's seminar program, and it's great to see all of you here in the flesh um, at the mezzanine. Um, I've almost forgotten how some of you look like as well, so it's good to see a, a good audience here tonight. Uh, let me also remind you that for the next three weeks in August, all the seminars will be delivered at the me mezzanine level. Um, a great opportunity to return to our social ways of pre-COVID times. Uh, we are social beings after all. A reminder that next week's seminar on Greek Australian women and welfare advocacy in the 1970s by Canberra-based ANU historian, Dr. Alexandra Delios. Um, and that'll be followed by uh, Dean Kelly Neal the following week. Um, on the um, 17th, it'll actually be a double header. We've got Dean Kelly Neal speaking on Pyrus, the Western Alexander. And before that, at six o'clock, uh, we have a visitor from Greece, uh, Michalis Pakoyanis, and his topic is on um, the poetry of Seferi during the Civil War. Is that correct, um, Steffi Kaposetsia? Yeah? And that will be in Greek, so it'll be a double head on the 17th. Now, tonight's speaker, um, Dr. Andonis Piperoglu, needs no introduction. He's the inaugural Hellenic Senior Lecturer in Global Diasporas at the University of Melbourne. Um, he's been in this position just over, just over a year, and he's hit the ground running. He's already teaching two subjects, Migrant Nation, History, Culture and Identity, a second year subject and an honours fourth year subject, The Long History of Globalisation. He also has a third subject um, uh, which is being prepared, Global Diasporas, Hellenic Cultures, uh, which is going through the faculty approval process and should be available in the second half of 2024. There's um, always a lot of bureaucratic hurdles at universities. Uh, one of Adonis's aims uh, for this subject is to, is to develop a novel assessment uh, that spurs students to actively map diasporic Melbourne. The subject aims to incentivise students to take on further study in Greek migration history and diaspora studies at honours, masters and PhD level. And apart from attending conferences and events, writing and delivering papers, Andoni is also being involved in planning the visit to Australia of Professor Yorgos Anagnostou from Ohio State University. He'll be in Australia for two months during October and November. Professor Anagnostou is one of the leading authorities on the Greek-American diaspora and evolving Greek-American identity. Uh, not to be missed by any means. Um, look out for any upcoming publicity. Uh, for those interested in diaspora study, he's a global authority on diaspora matters. Adonis's topic today, um, launching Little Greece, transcultural place naming and narratives of migration. Well, I feel quite certain most diaspora Greeks believe that all the Greeks of New York live or used to live in Astoria. Equally, I feel fairly certain that many people believe that Sydney Greeks either all live in Marrickville or Marrickville was one of their first staging posts in their diasporic journey. Uh, in early 2021, a precinct um, in Marrickville, a suburb in Sydney, Sydney's, Sydney's in the west, was named Little Greece. That Marrickville, an inner city suburb of Sydney, has a shared history of migrant settlement and adaptation isn't a surprise to most. Drawing on notions of transcultural placemaking, uh, this paper, this presentation will explore how ethnic community building and ethnic framing of suburbs share interrelated pasts and presents. However, in doing so, um, this renaming is not only emblematic of how Greeks are viewed as model contributors to contemporary Australian society, but uh, can also fall into the trap of ethnic singularity. Um, does one need to reconsider the history of Greek towns? Uh, as uh, ethnic neighbourhoods in which Greek migrants interact, interacted and coexisted with a range of other diasporic sort of subjects. Enough for me, uh, Andoni, the floor is yours. A big round of applause for our speaker tonight. Thank you, Nick. And uh, a big thank you, really, for since I commenced my role, it's been Wonderful to work with you and uh, and build uh, and build a kind of future in how we kind of can rethink what we're trying to do as a community 
And uh, I think this seminar series, which you've been leading for many years, has just grown and grown. And now I actually received an email from Greece this week, you know, asking, asking uh, to know more about this topic because that's the type of reach that the seminar has. I've said this before in this room quite a few times, but my mother uh, was born in Cyprus, and as a result, I've inherited a pretty robust, maybe healthy distrust of colonial regimes that I see tied to First Nations calls for sovereignty on this land. And it's because of this inheritance that I also would like to pay my respects, elders past, present, and emerging, but to also acknowledge that uh, indigenous peoples in this country have never ceded sovereignty. And this notion of sovereignty is pretty important one to think about in terms of upcoming referendum, sure, but ongoing sense of who uh, has governmental political claim to the land that we live on. Um, tonight, I'd like to suggest how we might think about the history of what we could think of as ethnic suburbia and embedded doing so better approach the story of how diasporas have been part of Australian placemaking. By exploring the context through which place naming has recently taken place in Marrickville, an inner city west suburb in city, and for Melburnians that don't know, you could kind of equate this to the inner, inner north here in Melbourne. Um, it, it has rose to become a kind of celebrated side of Australian multiculturalism and which has recently, as we know, been officially branded by the council as Little Greece. And something that I was only told this week is actually something that has been in the making for 20 plus years. I'm interested in teasing out how the framing of ethnic neighbourhoods was part and continues to be part of permeable, what we could think of as ethnicised becomings that may offer us something useful for today's pressing global historical questions, particularly how to grapple with the lingering legacies of colonialism and its relationship to our everyday multicultural realities. By examining the naming of Little Greece in Marrickville, whoop, we'll come back, very beautiful. I'm interested in how varied origins, histories, and framings of ethnic suburbs and streets. Yes, like North America's Greek towns, I particularly think of Chicago's Greek town, Toronto's Greek town, but also the Greek suburb of New York, Astoria, but also perhaps our Chinatowns, our Little Italy's. How can they be understood through what a scholar here, a scholar of public place, Jerry Hugh, has called transcultural placemaking. According to Hugh, transcultural placemaking comes out uh, often by individuals who occupy multiple worlds and carry with them multiple forms of knowledge and frames of reference. Let me just give you a little potted history of Marrickville. The Gadigal people of the Ora Nation have lived in Banjalaming area for about tens of thousands of years. And Marrickville today was actually the Gumbamora Swamp, which acted as an important wetland in Aboriginal life. Gumbamora was a source of plants and animals supporting dense growth of, of say, thatch reed, providing an excellent habitat for a variety of birds, particularly swamp hens, moor hens, ducks, gulls, and the occasional pelican. The name Marrickville comes from a 2.3 hectare Marrick estate of Thomas Chadler, which was then subdivided in the mid 19th century. You can see here in the, on the slide. Um, and I just want to make a note that Cook's River to the south is very much a borderland in Marrickville. After extensive clearing by early settlers, the, study, the suburb fast became a semi-industrial space, a place where housing and work were but a few streets apart. From the post-war period, migrants began to make the suburb home and were soon followed by Vietnamese refugees. Today, Addison Road's community organisation, which is perhaps Alex Delios is exploring this, a key site, in Australian multicultural activism. Um, but it's 
but it's now hall, Gamba Maro Hall, is now a site where a range of cross-cultural activities take place, African drumming circles, to workshops for women in the trade sector. From the mid-1980s onward, emergent growth in historical monographs and documentaries, art installations and literatures extensively focus on the dynamics of non-Anglo migration and ethnicity in the suburb. Effie and Leonard's work, groundbreaking, 1998 volume in their own image, Greek Australia, and it's a true pleasure to have them here tonight. Um, we can see Marrickville's uh, uh, St. Nicholas packed during a midnight Easter service. Effie and Leonard utilizing their complementary skills in photography and public history document here a particular yet enduring, familiar to us at least, facet of our suburban life, the annually attended religious tradition. Emmanuel Angelikas, who's also here with us tonight, uh, in a rather different vein, has been documenting the suburb for most of his life and photographic and career as a photographer. Emmanuel grew up in Marrickville. He's built a pretty extensive visual archive that reveals hidden treasures, dark corners, and back rooms. But he has also built a, a collection of a visual history, if you will, uh, that works in tandem with we could think about, I think about your grunge aesthetic, Emmanuel, um, that kind of captures the suburb's cultural layering. Shopkeepers and doctors are showcased together in everyday mode. Clearly, Effie, Leonard, Emmanuel's work testify that Marrickville has been a site of creative endeavor, and its diversity has been analyzed um, as kind of, it has been analyzed in key works of Australian multiculturalism. So take this book to your left, Ethnic Small Business. The quote I'm about to read is emblematic of a commonly held view which researchers who visited the suburb um, thought in, say, the 70s and 80s. Quote, heading south along the resided street of Marrickville proper, we see old Greek ladies making lace and doing fine embroidery, sitting on the doorsteps of blue houses. We hear the weir of sewing machines and observe the busy antics of vans stacked full of half-made clothing darting from house to house, delivering cloth and picking up garments from tired-looking Asian and Mediterranean women. Along Addison Road, abandoned shops now house clothing sweatshops and pressing services. Near the door of one of these sites, the Greek owner and insider Asian and Pacific Islander women furiously working to keep up their pace. The next quote, which is delivered by an elderly gentleman, is from this book on your right, White Nation, and it's recently been republished in this volume, The Racial Politics of Australian Multiculturalism, perhaps the most popular, but at simultaneously the most critical assessment of multiculturalism in Australia. And we can perhaps talk about the limitations, but also the kind of vision of what a multicultural Australia meant and what it has become a bit later. But here I'll give you an alternative view that's in this book. Quote, I say hello to the neighbours and they say hello back to me, and I do my thing and they do their thing. The lady next door, next door she's Italian. I might go into the bathroom there and she's seeing opera next door. She's into the opera business, and the people next door, ah, uh, they're Vietnamese, school teachers, you know? They all got young kids, you know? Ah, uh, like, they're all nice people. There's a group of Greeks in the street, they're all nice people, you know? Everyone in the street knows me, and you know that they've probably seen me stagger past some night going home drunk. But, ah, uh, you know, like, like Marrickville, you get the Greeks up there near the post office with their beads, you know, in hand. You know, sitting there and you get some of these Aborigines up there near the other end of the post office drinking their plonk or whatever. And, you know, they never cause no trouble. The only problem are those new Vietnamese up the road. They're like, you don't want to know. 
They only talk amongst themselves as if they're plotting or something. In comparison to the earlier observational narrative, which stresses a range of intersections mostly associated with work, much of which is conducted by women, this later example, which ends with the statement of intolerance, reveals not so much interaction, but an awareness of what can be viewed as safely tolerated. Greek men flicking their gombaloi alongside drinking indigenous people in what will become the site, literally, of Little Greece, is safe, while the plotting of some Vietnamese, not the v Vietnamese, is presented as a threat. In the time I have with you tonight, I'd like to address what I see as an underexplored aspect of the historical dynamics of what we can think of as ethnicized placemaking. I'm interested in how histories of ethnic community building can better interact with our everyday multicultural lives. Indeed, the word of Yoros Anagnostu, who Nick has just said, is an expert on Greek America, professor at Ohio State, and will be visiting us next month, reveals that non-threatening, depoliticized, celebratory, familiar, and commercialized ethnic difference has worked to affirm the assimilating drive of liberal multiculturalism. Such thinking, which is also explored in the book I mentioned earlier, The Racial Politics of Australian Multiculturalism, has been particularly influential on in my thinking for some time. As I think through the dynamics of the lived environments of Greek Australian ethnicities, and I put emphasis on the plural here, there are many different types of Greek Australians. I'm wondering how it might be possible to reconfigure histories of ethnicity around the essential role played by what we might think of as George Vasilikopoulos and Tula Nikolakopoulos term perpetual foreigners within, who have their own culturally specific historical imaginings to colonialism, migration, and contribution to Australian life. In rethinking Australian approaches to ethnic history, I'm hoping, hopeful that that it, it may be possible to regenerate an ongoing dialogue on how to conduct a multidimensional approach to histories of what I like to think of as reactive and adaptive ethnic spaces that examine, for example, the complexity of our inter-ethnic exchanges, us with other ethnics, the making of endur or, and endurance of pan-ethnic identifications. Is WOG an ethnicity? Is it not? or the processes at play when people choose to exit or consciously rework the parameters of an imposed ethnicity. I don't want to be this type of Greek. I want to be this other type of Greek. A dialogue that as this contemporary dialogue, sorry, as this contemporary uh, poster art um, in the suburb demonstrates, has the potential to reveal a plethora of transcultural interactions and hierarchies that op operate across geographically varied modes of exchange. Who is an Aussie? And by extension, who can claim ethnic Aussiness? What are the power relations between the historically informed street art and the streetwalker's self-reflective sense of ethnic identity? More broadly, what is the consumer culture towards ethnic heritage? And how is it part of a dispossessive or alienating historical tradition? Further, how do different cultural groups interpret, interact, and involve themselves in public space? Or to bring such questions into a digital present, how has social media broken down feelings of isolation from the homeland? while simultaneously creating what I increasingly seeing as a kind of hyper nostalgia for our migrant past here on the host land. By transculturalizing how ethnic suburbs are developed and then are currently redeveloping themselves, it may be possible to avoid reoccurring assumptions and absolute uniqueness and uniformity within and between ethnic groups that have made home in Australia. Indeed, we can move past a singular ethnic frame of reference. Northcote and Thornbury are Greek, for sure, but Northcote and Thornbury are also sites of cultural blending, becoming, and even blossoming. Marrickville is Little Greece, but it also has, despite 
it not being officially branded as such by the council, versions of Little Lisbon or Little Saigon. As such, I'm of the view that reapproaching histories of our migrant neighborhoods should require historical practitioners and thinkers inside and outside the walls of the university to consider the multiple ways in which culture operates um, and uh, how, the, say, the making of home here deter is determined by, by richly emotional kind of textured attachments to houses, driveways, streets, garages, gardens, small businesses, but also the kind of pervasive usages of ethnic inscription. Think about the Greek language signage and the presentations of ethnic cultural uh, capital in our public space. Classical motifs are easy to find. So take this mural by Ox King, which was commissioned for the opening of Little Greece. The artist, who has lived in Marrickville for many years, collaborated with local property owners, residents, and community, Greek community representatives on the concept. And I quote him here. In the heart of Little Greece, my artwork depicts the ancient goddess Hestia, transported within the modern Australian context of the Greek migrant story framed by a Greek pottery style and the green and gold color scheme of classical Australiana, the art explores and pays tribute to the Greek community in modern Marrickville, 200 years after their war of independence. Hestia, goddess of home and hearth, is depicted leaving her throne in Olympus to settle here in Marrickville, where she lights her hearth fire anew for the families of the migrant community. She is framed with panels referencing the 1821 War of Independence, St. Nicholas, the migrant ship, the Patris, and Greek food culture growing roots among Australian soil. The artist's complex amalgam of references to classical Greece and considered departures from, as well as returning to, stereotypical migrant suburban aesthetics articulates a creative rendering of Greek Australianness that deliberately presents layers of trans-historical connectivity. Byzantium and orthodoxy, the church, the halo, interacts with a goddess, the classical ideal, painted in a kind of Australian sporting colours. Migration is depicted by the mode of transport, the patris, and this is situated alongside gum leaves and an olive tree and its roots. Indeed, we can view the mural as a quick guide in Greek-Australian history and the representation of Greekness in our suburbs public space suggests not just, to say, a revival, but a gesturing to a fluid and hopefully malleable Greek diasporic experience. The inclusion of roots in the image here, I think, is most interesting. In an essay called With the Fig, the Olive and the Pomegranate Tree, Thoughts on Another Australian Belonging, Lebanese-Australian anthropologist Ghassan Hajj, who wrote the critical books on multiculturalism, plays with the concept of roots, R-O-O-T-S, and roots, or routes, R-O-U-T-E-S. We can see here our olive or lemon trees. We can stand and feel rooted in this country, feeling 100% Australian, 100% Greek. Roots, however, have a kind of bad name, in some circles at least. They're often associated with status, conservatism, sort of narrow-mindedness, a fixedness, being stuck. There's no doubt that roots can be experienced this way, especially if, if some people end up burying themselves in their roots and cannot see a difference between being rooted and being located within one's roots. Yet we do not have to universalise this sense of roots. A greater sense of rootedness does not mean a sense of occupying space statically, of being locked in the ground, unable to move. On the contrary, roots can be paradoxically experienced like an extra pair of wings. In this way, we can experience our many Mediterranean trees dotted across 
our migrant backyards and even our front yards propelling us. And it's important to stop and fully comprehend what propelling means here. When we're pushed by a force, we go forward. The same goes when a force is propelling us, yet there's an important difference. When we are propelled, the force stays with us. This seems to me the importance and the power of roots that Hajj as well refers to. And, and our roots do not need to be kept in the ground. They're roots that stay with us as we move, both literally and conceptually in our minds. And I think the mural goes some way to capture this feeling of roots that moves with us. Yet if we analyze, and this is, this is the essay and this is my mum and dad, and you know, one of the first things they did was plant their olive tree in Canberra. Um, you know, this, is, this, is, this, this, this both creates a new sense of Greece, but it also entrenches you moving yourself into, into your suburban world in a new way. Yet if we analyze the launch of Marrickville and just a little, a little note, you know, this is Albanese's, this is Albanese's street, right? Greek labor is part, part of this journey. Yet if we analyze the launch of Marrickville's Little Greece, something was evaded in the diasporic pressing, press's reporting of the official naming ceremony. We can perhaps forgive them, as it was hard to miss, although some journalists did manage to capture the welcomed country and associated indigenous dance performance that accompanied this ceremonious occasion. That is, despite recognition that the ceremony was meant to coincide with the Greek bicentenary and therefore resistance to colonial rule, as is referenced in the words in the mural, there was no mention of indigenous sovereignty. That is, despite elder Auntie Deb Lennis, who gave a detailed account of the pre-colonial landscape of the suburb, including the swamp mentioned earlier, literally saying as a representative of indigenous land council that here, on this end of Marrickville, we lend, lend this land to you. Although, the story of naming, sorry, although the story of the naming of a section of Marrickville as Little, as Little Greece is perhaps not the most conspicuous in the greater story of Greek, Greeks populating Australian suburbs, I think it highlights how ethnic place naming has conveniently avoided the colonial realities of ethnic space and the approaches to acknowledging our laid histories on these lands. By refreshing historical approaches to the formation and reformation of migrant neighborhoods, we may be propelled to move beyond state and force policy regimes and consumerist branding of laneways and blank warehouse walls as sites of ethnic becoming and multicultural success. The quest to provide narratives of ethnic contribution by our council representatives in tandem with historically often one-sided but engaged, frequently male figureheads of our ethnic communities, I'm suggesting can be understood as crucial to understanding the persistent parochialism of what constitutes migrant neighborhoods, together with ideas of how to acknowledge and then revise our colonial heritage in tandem with our cosmopolitan present. In a nutshell, thinking seriously about space naming and how it can be trapped within culturally homogenous or singular ethnic frames of reference can help in understanding how Greek diaspora players have mediated forms of ethnic essentialism, even as, a, even as they may seem to erode the imagined and real boundaries of an assumed ethnic core. I'm also of the view that construing migrant neighborhoods as simply a clean history that is already understood, solely attached to an assertive post-war era of celebratory multiculturalism, obscures our neighborhood's contemporary historical relevance, lived realities, and, we have to face it, its contradictory political character. If we consider Sparta Place in Brunswick, which clearly essentializes an allure of classical antiquity, 
or the emergent mural project led by Dean in Footscray, or even the unveiling of the reproduction of Greek friezes on this building, and we apply the term transculturalism as a concept, we as a committed ethnic community builders may be able to expand our grasp of what an ethnic neighbourhood means and to embrace the realities of the cross-cultural interactions and in, in, entanglements that encompass our lives. Focusing on the centrality of ethnic, ethnicized suburbia to the logistics of the multicultural nation, I think opens up possibilities for thinking about the rev relevance of everyday diversity as a structure in our kind of multi-site. Northcote doesn't exist without it being on one side of the river to the other. Marrickville doesn't exist without it being in tandem with the eastern suburbs of Sydney but also intradiasporic modes. Our, the Greeks in, in these communities are varied and they speak among each other, to each other, battle with each other. These migrant worlds that, that are kind of entered onto and co-contribute then to the kind of invasive and intrusive dynamics on First Nations land, but they also offer a multitude of perspectives customs and rituals that go some way in taking away the homogenous, racializing context of this nation. Finally, I'd like to conclude by suggesting that if one accepts our suburbs as historically and culturally variable, and moreover that, there are symbolic, that their symbolic formation is, is at least in part bound up with the formation and reformation of colonial histories, then one is perhaps likely, likely to be critical of many past forms of ethnic place naming. It is not just that ethnicized place naming tends to draw on and indeed rely on a static conception of ethnicity, but that there is often a blindness to the changing connotations of ethnic identities. A myopia that leads to a simple interpretation of ethnics in the suburbs as purely and perpetually outsiders within. Recently, the city of Moreland was renamed Marybeck. Moreland was named after an 18th century Jamaican slave estate, and the name required, in our public historical consciousness, required it to be redressed. I'm quoting from the councillor here. Moreland stands firmly against racism. We are, not, we are one community, proudly diverse, this, um, um, and, and adding, we're committed to working with the Wurundjeri people, and we take the request for renaming very seriously. Now, the renaming of our diaspora has jumped on board. And just think about this distinction for a moment. The Hellenic community of Moreland, written in Greek, written in English, becomes Eleniki Kinotita Marybeck. The English, or at least the Anglo-English, is lost. So in short, suggesting how we might reorientate our histories of migrant neighborhoods by looking at different forms of cultural interaction and exchange, we may be, dedicate, uh, as dedicated diasporic practitioners, better understand how ethnic neighbourhoods, streets and buildings, such as this one, can a part of multi-layered historical sites that often replicate a kind of historical blind spot of a lagged colonial come national tradition, yet are firmly steeped in an uplifting historical approaches and heritage projects that offer stimuli for expanding our conception of our transcultural everyday lives. So I finish here with two questions. How can we reimagine, say, Lonsdale Seat Greek precinct to better interact, yep, with the endurance of indigenous heritage while simultaneously facing up to the reality that every day and night a cosmopolitan Asian Australianist traverses its streets? What might a reframing of Greek culture in Australian public space look like if it also embraced the many roots that have made us feel comfortable to embrace this place as home? Thanks.
And I, and I just, just quickly, for those who don't know Marrickville, this spot here, Marrickville Port Ro Pork Rolls, I mean, the line, the line for this place on a daily basis rivals that, that which waited to see the Queen. You know, um, and, and, and I guess what I'm, in a, in a nutshell, trying to say is, there's good reason relating to power that a section of a suburb gets to be called Little Greece and not Little Saigon, right? Even though this is a very popular, you know, it, it, it sits in the same space. Um, questions? Okay. Thank you very much, Andoni, for that thought-provoking sort of presentation. And I'm sure we'll have a few questions from, from, from the audience. Who's going to make, make the start? I know you're not a shy lot. And, um, Donny, just out of curiosity, when did the Greek population peak in Marrickville? Uh, I'm not too familiar with its history. I'm pretty sure it's in the 70s. Um, but, it, but from those, or the children of those migrants that came out, they would probably have a very different view that their kind of high school years in the 80s, you know, were these, was this flourishing time. And Marrickville works in tandem with Elv Elwood, the suburb next door, which um, um, is sort of like, reminds me of a little bit of like a Fairfield. Like it's smaller, but it but it's quieter, but it's next door. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome session, dude. That's <laughs> this is Dean's mural. Yeah. So that's something we've been working on. That is actually very sort of community owned. It's come from. I guess a large inspiration being local, uh, having access to these people, often stories that don't sort of come to the surface. How can we expect our councils and other mainstream organisations to do that when maybe that cultural um, access doesn't exactly exist? I mean, even though we had it, obviously there are bits still missing and layers. W what's your sort of take on that? I think then you need to go to council with this type of evidence, and you need to you need to frame. Um, whether it's this word transcultural, you need to frame that the, the kind of issue of multiculturalism is unresolved, that the kind of way that government can help deal with cultural difference could be through the expression of art projects that you're leading here, right? But in doing so, you risk the trap of what I'm trying to address of, of telling one story of what is a very diverse suburb. And in doing so, right, that if to get council on board, I think you need to be wider in your spread, right? Not to critique the mad effort that you've been, that you've been doing, you know, to say it should be, you know, it's not in the right direction, but that what, what would it mean, let's just say, if, if, if you told me the other night about dim sims being sold in some of these shops and ping pong being played upstairs in the Hellenic, in the Hellenic club, right? How can you put that into the mural and then tell, tell council, right? This is an encompassing, embracing story that isn't just attached to one singular ethnic trope. And the trope here, which is commonly understood and taught in schools, and we kind of in have, ha have inherited it, is to say the Greeks came, they worked really, really hard in their shops, they did pretty all right in their businesses, and now they're Australian. And it's like, but are they? Are they fully Australian? And what does that story do to embracing the reality of our cosmopolitan lives. Because what it does is it centers, here's the Anglo councillor or government, and here are the ethnics that are going to relate to it, right? But what of the Greek-Italian marriage? What of, the, uh, what of that ping pong session upstairs in the Hellenic club, right? So it's like, my, my thing is to say, it, it requires a new vernacular to say, and evidence, therefore, to show, hey, like this is something fresh, new, and not a same old nostalgia, right? It's it, that, that people are able to go and say, I not only really see my, the diversity of the world I live in in this, in this image, say, eh, 
um, but also that it's, it's, it's empowering me to be something else. Does that make sense? It does, actually. Um, the, initial, the initial inspiration of this project like, started two and a half years ago. Um, these things obviously take time. What we wanted to do initially was overlap the southern European wave of migration with that uh, Indo-Chinese wave of migration, with that more recent Horn of Africa wave of migration. But you realise the more complexity you add to it, exponentially the more difficult it is. And obviously for a volunteer effort, um, we would have just, you know, it never would have happened. And sometimes when you broaden that scope too much, it's too many steps ahead for that council to understand. So we've had, we've had no support, unfortunately, from the council mm -hmm. from a monetary mm -hmm. perspective. Um, and even the arts team, there are arts programs that exist, but this is already outside of the scope. I um, mean, I, I know Emmanuel's in, in the room, and maybe you know this, I'm not sure, Emmanuel, but I'm... I'm I, a whisper from a Billy Kotsis, who sometimes writes for Neo Cosmos, told me, right, that it's like they have proximity and members on the council. The Greeks have members on the council. And then these are particular men <laughs> that have a particular say in the type of Greek Australianness to be represented on the public street, right? So, you know, that. That's something to be considered. Who's representing what narrative and where? And what are the parallations that allow that to come about, right? I just wanted to go back to well, power, and you alluded <laughs> to that earlier. Um, why it took so long for Little Greece? Is it still Little Greece? Is it a second generation who pushed for Marrickville so, you know, I don't know what the demographics is. That, you know, uh, have people moved out? Are they moving back in? But yeah, why it took so long, and how um, the other ethnic groups, uh, Vietnamese and others, um, was that about sort of asserting that Greek history uh, because it was getting lost uh, through other groups coming in, or just yeah, that sort of power dynamic. Emmanuel's probably got an answer. I. I, and I guess my, my, my main thing to interject at this moment would be, not interject, but to add to this is to say, <laughs> the suburb is hip to the beat, right? It is like, it is having, it, what is, was an extremely working class, you know, when I'm mentioning those women in their sewing machines, darting vans, I mean, this was, this was Marrickville. And now, actually related to the lockout laws that Sydney had, so they had, lockout laws in the city, you couldn't drink after a certain hour, but Marrickville was outside of that boundary. And now, you, now this Yaya's dive bar, right, is actually in, a, in the, what was the pan-Greek, or the, the Greek uh, Macedonian Association, it was the Alexander the Great Club, and now it's called the Great Club, right? And gigs are happening there. It's similar to, I don't know if you know, Capers up on, in, in Thornbury, uh, which, uh, which is run by a Cypriot young man, but also um, is like, it's sort of like this new, new wave of diasporic youth uh, appropriating something related to this migrant world that their grandparents and parents are from, but they're reworking it within a kind of hipster beat aesthetic, right? So much so that then Sydney gets voted in as like the coolest, Marrickville gets voted as the coolest suburb, right? By Time Magazine or whatever, right? So, I, and the, there's kind of, I think then, two aspects of power to think about. One is the power related to the narrative of diversity directed by the, straight, the state and those on the outside, the others, the ethnics. But then there is power within our communities themselves, right, of who is representing and, and directing the narrative of what constitutes Greek Australia. I have to admit that when I first saw the mural, which is the kind of crescendo of the naming of Little Greece, right? It really annoyed me because I'm like, why, why again? Why does Greece have to be represented in its ancient form? Right? Um, 
I'm less critical of it now. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm less, I'm like, I see, I see what the artist has done, but the artist himself is not Greek. Does that, what does that mean? He's commissioned by council. You know, this is, this is part of a, of, a, of a consumerism. This is part, you know, he's paid. He's paid as an artist, you know. Who got to choose him as an artist, right? These are the questions that an anthropologist can ask. I, I'm a historian. I'm interested in, in reading it for how it, what it tells us about the framing of history. Theo. <laughs> and then Emmanuel had his hand up, Nick. Very interesting talk, Anton. This, uh, but I'm a little bit surprised that you haven't gone into the reason why the Greeks went to Marrickville. And from my understanding, back in the 60s, probably a third of the Greeks in Sydney lived in Marrickville. And if you look at Marrickville, Marrickville was basically a working class suburb. And in the 60s, the statistics that I read claimed that about over 900 industries were placed in the city of Marrickville. And that's the reason why the Greeks went to Marrickville, because that's the place where they could work. So, yes, I'm a little bit surprised with that um, symbol over there. I would have preferred maybe something that represented the, the Greeks of the 60s who made up Marrickville, okay? And that's something important, because Marrickville wouldn't have existed without the Greek working class. And that's probably, it's probably significant, I'm sure George Vasilikopoulos will point this out, that uh, the Atlas Workers League yep. is based in Marrickville, and I think it was based in Marrickville in the 50s and 60s too. So there was a reason why the Greeks congregated in Marrickville, and I think that's important to understand why Marrickville was developed. And I don't think you can compare it to any other suburb in Melbourne, because in Melbourne the, the Greeks were sort of, they were um, distributed amongst more inner suburbs, rather than it was Collingwood, it was Richmond, it was Paran, it was Port Melbourne. But in Sydney, for some reason, I think Marrickville was the, was the in place in the 60s at least. So I think it's important that that that's be stipulated in the history of Marrickville yeah, okay, anyway. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I'll add to that. I, I would say you're right. I mean, nothing's the same and doesn't mirror. I, I think Brunswick, Brunswick has mm. this interesting correlation. Mm. That there are there are there are semi-industrial warehouse sites scattered across Brunswick, mm. less and less these days, right? Um, this is very different mm. from, say, Collingwood. Or and I think what happened in Marrickville, deindustrialisation happened earlier, like in the 70s and 80s, and that's when the Greeks left Marrickville a bit earlier. Look, I'm not a Sydney side, and I shouldn't be speaking <laughs> about it, but that's my gut feeling from a person that's had an interest in the Greek community overall, and especially in Sydney. That's how I explain. What happened there in Marrickville? Let, Thank let, you. Let me let me just um, also just mention this notion about class in the post-war era. So, if 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 we again, like I'm simplifying a very complex historical past, but we kind of say Australia wanted more people, and they would happily take these people and exploit them to work in these industries. And what I'm saying is the common narrative, right, in, in the canon of Australian history, if you talk to the kind of the Australianist historians, right, so I'm, on the, I'm on the outer edge of that, right, to say uh, that their narrative will be, and they did work really hard, and they made their money, and they their kids then you know, generational differences aside, became educated, and then they became good assimilated Australians. And I guess what I'm trying to say, is, which is sort of what your comment makes me think, is to say there is a shadow assimilation. The assimilation is not to become Anglo, 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 but it is to be uh, living in the hyphen living in the this and that at the same time, which allows you to live with other hyphens, which forms a sort of third Australia, an Anglo, the sort of other ethnic and the indigenous Australia, right? And, and so I, when we think about just living in those suburbs, that Emmanuel's mum did this labour, right? Like, like sewing alongside Vietnamese women, 
is a particularly Australian experience that tells us something about our multicultural suburb, right? That is not just saying rosy, celebratory, happy, successful multicultural suburb, right? reason we keep on harping on about the successful Greek migrant. Well, guess what? I was, I lived the 60s and 70s here, and now I know many, many families who suffered, many families repatriated. There was gambling issues in the Greek community. Yeah, yeah. I mean, why? I, I'm just one person, Theo, and, and we'll get there hopefully through my students to say... <laughs> yeah, but, but what, I, what I'm saying is... So we're in a successful community. But I'm but okay, I, I, so let's just say, what would a history of domestic violence in our Greek Australian homes look like? What would a history of patriarchal dominance look like in our in our in our community? What would a history of disability look like? What would a history of right? These are these are not these are these are very hard in the academy to get there. And we will get there, right? But, but you're absolutely right. It won't. You can't tell the good story without being having that ability to be critically self-reflective on also the challenges of who we are, how we got there, how we didn't get there. Right, Emmanuel? Yeah, yeah. yeah give the guy a chance. He's only been 12 months in the job. <laughs> right? um, first of all, Adonis, thank you uh, for a really, really um, insightful presentation. Um, for those that don't know, my name is Emmanuel Angelicus and I've lived in Marrickville for more than 50 years. Um, from a very young age, I have been documenting the neighbourhood. But I'd like to put into perspective the scale of the area and the actual understanding of Marrickville uh, you talk about Marrickville, the suburb, but a lot of Greeks lived in Newtown. Mm -hmm. A lot of Greeks lived in St Peter's. A lot of Greeks lived in what was before the Inner West Council. It was the Marrickville Municipality. It was a much bigger playground, a lot more happening. But Marrickville and Enmore, which are the guts of the municipality, were the hub. And more doesn't get mentioned. Marrickville does, but they were the same. Um, yes, my mother did the piecework sweatshop stuff, and um, you know it 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 wasn't easy. Um, and I was fortunate to be able to record it. Um, but if we go back to the mural, mm. um, and you know e e acknowledging different cultures. I'd like everybody to read what it says. It says Philotimo. Tell me what that means. <laughs> okay, so they commission a mural on the wall. Does anyone else know where else it appears? <laughs> on garbage bins. Okay, so, so if, you, <laughs> garbage if, you walk, bins. if you walk the street of, of so I'll just give context, if you yeah. walk the street of what is Little Greece, where there is that post office that I mentioned in that 1980s interview. There is now, as any public street would, have, there would be garbage bins along the, along the thoroughfare. These garbage bins, as we do in, in Australia, we encase our garbage. We don't like to see the rubbish bin, so we encase it in a nice, comfortable box. And these boxes now have the mural on them. And so, and what does that say no, about no, consuming? I just wanted to add. I don't yeah. um, and what was really interesting was when they were being installed. I was actually walking down the main street with a Vietnamese friend of mine, and we were going to get a pork roll. And he said to me, "What's that mean?" Like, what's, what's this all about? And I said, oh, they're acknowledging 
us Greeks, you know, little Greece. And he said, but what, what does that word mean? And I said, I don't know, I guess it means kindness. I mean, you know, it means warmth, it means love, it can mean acceptance, it can mean a whole lot of things. And he said, what's it doing on a bin? <laughs> right? A Vietnamese. And what's also really interesting is that the Vietnamese don't give a shit about being labelled Little Vietnam. They don't care. They don't need that kind of acknowledgement. Um, and the other argument is that I've got a lot of Middle Eastern friends in Lakemba. There's no way they're ever going to call that Little Beirut. Mm. No way. Mm. Um, so, personally, and with this acknowledgement, Little Greece, before that, for years, they were pushing for Little Athens. And it was supposed to be done in the 80s. And they were always looking for excuses, always looking... and. Eventually, they put that up, which, personally, I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Emmanuel. Okay. Hello, my dear friend. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I'd just like to add a little bit to the debate in regard to Marrickville. We all occupy imagined spaces, a multiplicity of imagined spaces, politically, culturally, and even economically. We believe in certain things in terms of how we go about our daily lives. Now, within Marrickville, the gentleman up the back, yes, the Greeks had started leaving physically, although there are still Greeks there, in the broader Marrickville local government area. But interestingly, quite recently, I was doing some work with Effie and we were looking at Marrickville for a publication that she's bringing out. And what I tended to find was that even though the numerical presence of Greeks at Marrickville has certainly diminished compared to the 1960s. When you take a look at who owns what property, it's quite interesting the large numbers that are still there and still have voting rights and hence going back um, to the idea that there is traction between the representatives of Greeks within council and what can actually take place in terms of affirmations and what is appropriate. Those type of symbols, such as the murals, are imagined affirmations, if I could put it that way. And it also indicates what political traction has been taking place. And the reason for that, in terms of property ownership within the local government area, the Greeks certainly are quite numerous. All right? They now have political clout and they utilise it. It may not be out there in the public, and they may not be physically present there, but they certainly have that political clout. So, thanks, Leonard. It, 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 it is beyond me at this stage in my career, or perhaps my interests, but it certainly has uh, been in my mind for some time. Uh, I am at the intersection of migration history and histories of colonialism. I'd like to bring those two histories into conversation. I'm trying to. When we think about, when we say, you know, I acknowledge on this land, when we think about ourselves on this land, I think this issue of property is a very interesting one to explore. That is to say, a, a lot of, of property management property ownership, construction, have links to our diasporic culture. And property and the relationship of property to the British colonial mind is inseparable. They're the ones that subdivided. They're the ones that have an individualist sense of boundary and border and ownership of space. It's very different from the Choryos that we're from. A very different conception of sharing space, living in space. So I'm just, just like, imagine what that history would like, an intergenerational study of the migrant and the accumulation of wealth and the purchasing of property over time. Very hard thing to analyse, but it would tell us a lot about our place here and then how we relate to land.
I'd just like to um, bring up a different point of view. I actually think this um, mural, the street names, the suburb, the name, I, I don't see how it, it's not an acknowledgement to me. I just see it as an insult. And I just see you labelling an enclave. I see the people, I see the members of the MCC Long Room laughing at us from afar. I, I don't think it does anything. It, this, this deep rooted, you know, it's, it's almost too simply saying sorry for the way you've treated the Greeks over the years. We'll give you a street name, you know, we'll name this, this town, you know, in the 80s. I don't know when Greek town was named. You know, the hell that the Greeks went through for a hundred years, traversing the country doing crap work and then post-war as well. And what, we give you a street name, we give you a little suburb, we, we do this mural, we make you feel good. It, it's not right. I couldn't agree more, Florence, but it hurts when, I guess it hurts <laughs> intellectually, but also in, in a diasporic sense of my own self that there are Greeks leading the charge. That is to say, they are buying into a particular framing of multiculturalism that suits a prevailing idea of, our, of the nation's history, that suits a prevailing idea about how to manage the diversity. So yeah, like give them a, give them a little street name, right? Thanks, thanks Adonis. Always a pleasure listening to you. Um, as far as I can see, you are trying to make the academic and the political speak to each other. And that's very, very admirable. Um, a couple of things. In your presentation, um, many of the photos, if not most of the photos, were from Greek shops. Mm -hmm. So somehow, Little Greece um, becomes publicly accessible, uh, creates a visual dimension through the Greek shop, and perhaps the Greek church. Now, uh, just by looking at the photos, I went straight back to what I've seen visually from the 1920s and the 30s. Mm -hmm. There is no much difference there. Mm -hmm. So the photo by itself does not really reveal the time, the moment of time. Okay, it you, be you mean the shop? Yeah, yeah, the fish and chips, you know, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, Greek, the Greek shop. Yeah. So what is interesting is in the 1920s and 30s, the Greek shop was a very negative symbol for the broader community. Okay? At its most extreme and most usual, perhaps, it was a, sh a shop that would... Uh, accommodate slaves, basically. It was a slave labor. You have written about this, a very, very interesting article. So the public image of the Greek was the, the shop, and the shop was the slave shop, basically. On the other hand, the Greek community, through uh, symbols like the church, would try collectively to present the good face. So here we have and irre irresolvable tension, how the Greeks presented themselves and how they were seen by the broader community. Now, this tension can tell us something about today's um, Australia, and I would make my point <laughs> very shortly. No, no. Okay. Now, uh, through symbols like the church, would, uh, Greeks would present themselves not as citizens, but as a cultural group. And culture here was related to tradition, uh, perhaps habits. But on the other hand, the Greek shop as the slave shop was a symbol of the incapacity of the Greek migrant to fully participate in the project of modern Australia. Now, why? Because as far as, as I understand, the project of modern Australia, or perhaps the project of white Australia, w was never a cultural project. It was a civilizational project. Okay? So the Greek had a culture which was very archaic. It belonged to the past. Australia was the bearer of modern civilization in its best possible expression. And in between, the slave shop was the symbol of the incapacity 
of the Greek to participate in this civilizational process, um, uh, at the heart of which was a certain kind of relating uh, relation between labor and capital. Mm. Okay? Mm. So the, the, the white Australian utopia, mm. the harmony of classes, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. Now, if we move to, m to, to more recent times, if we move to today's Australia, if indeed there is a difference between civilization and culture, mm -hmm. then we have many cultures, multiculturalism in Australia, operating within one civilization. Mm -hmm. okay? Civilization has to do with um, uh, manners of organizing society, with institutions, with legal thinking, with you know, all those you know, very big things. Culture has to do with perhaps habits that people who are the bearers of the culture think of themselves as something, think of the culture as something very important, and of course it is for them, but more or less it is a culture, and most of the time ethnic cultures come from the past. Okay? So from a civilizational perspective, the, the, the white Australian in ethnic cultures sees a past that belongs to the past, basically. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> they have the quality of, of museum, the museum, mm -hmm. okay? That's one thing. So the recognition that is given to us in public spaces goes back to something the last speaker made the point, sorry, your name? Florence. Flora? Uh, Florence made, 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 made the point, you see. It's a kind of, yes, our civilization has matured enough and has created a space for what in the past we thought was inferior or, or whatever. Okay? Mm. There was a time in the 40s and in the 50s that migrants like the Greeks managed to bring together culture and politics and participate in the civilizational discourse of modern Australia. And they did that through the, the slogan, freedom or death. Uh -huh. It's a long story. It's a long, it's a long story. I'm uh, sorry I missed yeah. your talk last week. Yeah, no, 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 that's okay. Yeah. Um, yes, so I think that that's, that's my final kind of point and perhaps question. I think in your project, um, the civilizational, civilization culture difference is quite important. Mm. And the question of how, if we want to repoliticize the communities, how to bridge the gap is a huge theoretical and political question. Mm. Um, in my opinion, uh, a possible answer is through acknowledging uh, indigenous sovereignty, okay? But in order for us to do that, we have to go back to the fundamentals which relate to the uh, ontology and um, ways of knowing that constantly invoke, as you mentioned before, property. Mm. The project of civilization, the modern project of civilization, is ultimately the project of property. But this will take us somewhere else. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm, oh, I, I'm very mindful, and I, let, me, let me explain it like this. George is one of our <coughs> philosophers, and I mean this in a very serious way. So my take on civilization may be different to yours. There is one addition there I want to make. I, I agree with you. Um, the dynamics of labor and racism are also inseparable in this country. Like The reason why white Australia comes to be is because there is fear that the white worker is threatened. Right. So we don't want the Chinese to take the jobs and the Greeks also become part of that. But they are let in legally. And I think they're let in legally, right? That is, they can't, they're allowed to come here and set up these businesses. Because they can make a pretty clear case of their civilization exceptionalism. That the role then that the European Enlightenment had a stake and reorientating itself towards the classical ideal and saying, laying claim to that, or, or in a colonialist way, um, 
some people call it crypto colonialism. It's like it's colonialism, but it's not quite colonialism. But they're directing the control of the narrative of what Greek civilization is. This is French, British, German. So some Greeks, not all, some, some who are well versed in the language of British imperialism in this early period that you're talking about, I think, from the Ionian Islands, are well versed in speaking back to British authorities, white Australian British authorities, to, to claim their civilizational exceptionalism, to say, ah, you know, we, 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 you may question us as not being the right type of settler, of not being quite white enough, but we, we, we are the Greeks of the ancients, and therefore you have to accept us. But these are men of business, and these are the men that represent this community, uh, Lekatas, this place, you know, um, for Lagos, started up in Brisbane as well. These are, the, these are the originators of our communities that made a whole lot of money very quickly off the back of the labor based off their kinship networks. So that's one thing about that earlier period, 20s, 30s. If I'm to expand my notion of civilization, how you are framing it in tandem with culture, this to me is the glo this to me is the globe the the issue of the leg the lingering legacy of our colonial present. So to then say. Um, Take the diaspora out of the picture. Just look at Spring Street. Look at the design of the building. Look at what it looks like. <laughs> you know, it's a temple. <laughs> it's not far removed from this. The murals re-representation of classicism. Classicism has this weird ability to rework itself over and over and over and over. And so what I'm saying here is that Greece, as an idea is transcribed across Australian landscape in a particular way that uh, I don't think there are exceptions. You know, you could think about Italians and Romanness, maybe. There are exceptions, but I think that this is a unique case in the Greek experience. Just think about Mount Alexander, Mount Macedon. The Diamantina River in, in Queensland, Roma, a town in Queensland. Uh, the, the, this is about Britain's relationship and therefore by extension white Australia's relationship to the idea of Greece that they're laying claim to. And I, I, this persists, is I guess what I'm saying. This persists, it's transcribed across our landscape, this kind of Greece as the beginner, as the originator. And this rubs really badly <laughs> in relation to indigenous self-determination, peoplehood and sovereignty, right? There's a very, very, I mean, a lot of indigenous artists will use the classical motif in, in very interesting ways to reassert themselves as a legitimate, not historic culture to speak back. Right. This doesn't get to perhaps what you what you're what you're getting me. But I mean, I, 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 I cannot. This is we early on Monday. We had Nick Dumanis, who's just written a long history of Greece. This was sort of absent in his book, and that's OK. But that is to say. There's a difference between Greeks and then how ideas of Greece. And we in the diaspora well know how some people perceive ancient Greece as if we, we were to know it or we're to embody it or something. Um, and, and this is very powerful, I think, in the construction of this nation. Basically, he's articulated it, <laughs> what I was thinking. But Marrickville is a case in point in terms of colonial settler society and how the Greeks bought into it. Basically, they became entrepreneurs. Not all of them. Not all of them succeeded. But those who did succeed became entrepreneurs commercially and therefore bought a ticket 
into, well, I call it the great lie in terms of who the original settlers were, who actually has sovereignty on the land, but who has political control here. They bought into that. And the institutions which they established here, even a HEPA, for instance, most people consider that a HEPA was um, instituted in this country um, for philanthropic reasons. It wasn't. It certainly wasn't. It was acquired primarily because uh, Greeks, commercial Greeks, were experiencing racism and what they did was they played the game. A number of Greeks, about 20, got themselves together. They managed to collect a huge amount of financial backing. And with that, they were able to curtail or undermine those individuals who were trying to sell them goods at inflated prices. So they used the, own, the tactic of commercialism and monopolisation against the British colonial society. But in terms of that mural, for me, what that represents is the sell-off, okay? Um, it doesn't represent any sense of nostalgia or cultural pride for me. And I'm not a Greek <laughs> in terms of my, my birth anyway. Um, but what Andonis has been talking about, as far as I'm concerned, is the future in regard to the historiography developments within this country of how we should be looking at ourselves and perceiving ourselves and the interrelationships between people. And those interrelationships include manipulation. And not just simply manip a manipulation from one particular group to another, but intro those people within groups also exploiting to become part of this great idea of colonial settler society. But for the Greeks, as far as I'm concerned with the work that we've undertaken, it's, it's generally been acceptance in terms of commercial success and then the acquisition of property and with that also then political clout or political traction. That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> Thank you. I guess, um, yeah, the way I see all this is part of a bigger puzzle and I just kind of want to caution people not to take like a yes or no or a good or bad take on any of these things. These are all art forms, you know, and they all have their own limitations. And obviously there are certain things that work well, maybe aesthetically on a mural and other themes that sort of don't. But I think we have to look at this in the broader context of all of our creative storytelling efforts. Um, we mentioned things like gambling or domestic violence or all the other things that are tied up in our, in our culture. Um, maybe film is something that can start to pry away at that. And that's actually something we're brainstorming. Um, I guess what I'm trying to ask people to do is when they think about projects like these, we're, we're also making certain assumptions about how it came to be. Um, maybe there are interesting processes that happen behind the scenes to, to generate this image. Um, I know in ours we went and consulted all those families individually, for example, and I guess it depends... Well, not on not not from everybody actually. So we can I can I guess share that if you're curious. But but um, that's a, but that's the point, Dean. Is like money is being spent, and whose money is it, and what are their agendas, and that and that you need to consider that when you're putting up a particular representation of Greek footscray, as you say, you need to, you need to like consider. Right, there, there is there is power involved, right? And, and that's and, what I'm just and saying. And vested interests, and for you then to th consider then that 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 type of relation, you're, if you're to see yourself as a youth leader of the next generation of the diaspora, right? And you're 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 positioning it in a particular frame that tells the same type of success story, right? Then then you are you are doing us a disservice to redoing rethinking the potential of what's possible. I guess right? all, all I'm saying is that it also comes with other interpretations. So don't look at just one interpretation. Look at the collection and maybe give it time because we are working on other things in the future, but you can only work on one thing at a time, at least in a volunteer capacity. So there is other things complementing, for example, our mural. There is real consultation complementing that as well. We're talking with Vietnamese museum that's popping up locally. We're talking with Ethiopian street traders that are local too. So but all I'm saying is they're that... They're not in the mural, Dean. No, they, they, I guess, couldn't be in this effort because that became exponentially, I guess, difficult and kind of impossible for me at this current point in time. But there is a lot of behind the scenes that doesn't reveal itself. And that's all I'm encouraging people to think about. Give it time and you'll see what else that is connected to. Give it time and you might even see young people inspired by the Philotim or the Hestia mural in Sydney that may be justified in some ways. It just depends what our arbiter of being good is. Um, I think there are different ways to look at it too. Thanks. Thanks.
We've got until midnight, but I will, <laughs> I, will, I will take one final question. Going once, going twice. Thank you for coming. Thank Big you. round of applause for us. Um, don't forget, next week, Alexander Delos. And also, take advantage of this time to browse the books at the back. We've got a few new titles.